I call Carmel Sipolorni. Mr Chair, I want to continue on where the Green Party member Jan Logie left off. And I just want to refer back to the main issue here, and that is that we have 305,000 children in New Zealand living in poverty. And I think that's something that all of us in this House should be ashamed of. The reality is, though, we don't have the numbers to make legislative change like that side of the House does, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, of that 305,000 children who are living in poverty, 60 per cent of them are in beneficiary households. 40 per cent of them are in working households. 40 per cent of them, Mr Chair, are earning so little money that they are also living in poverty. And we need to make that connection. We care about children living in poverty. If we care about children living in poverty, then we also have to care about the people who are looking after those children living in poverty, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I've put up a number of supplementary order papers to amend this bill. We support any increase that will go to our poorest families. Of course, as my colleague Jacinda Ardern pointed out, we don't understand the science behind how the government assessed $25 per family as being the right amount. We know that that will do very little to actually address the poverty issue, but it does a little bit. And so we can't deny our poorest families that, Mr Chair. But we do have some concerns, and those concerns are addressed by the supplementary order papers I put up. Uh, one of the concerns, Mr Chair, is the extension of the work obligations from 15 to 20 hours per week. And so we had the Minister stand up before and tell us that there is evidence to support that. The Minister cited Norway and other European countries as examples of where a uh, 20-hour work obligation for parents with a youngest child of three. Um, and I just want to point out to the Minister that actually in countries like Norway, work is readily available. That's actually not the case here. In fact, we currently have 58,000 people actively seeking part-time work. So to place the expectation on these sole parents when actually the work is not available is a little bit unrealistic, Mr Chair. We had the Minister saying that people wouldn't be pressured into taking up work that was inappropriate, but I've had so many stories told to me by sole parents undertaking employment courses through Work and Income New Zealand where they are getting pressure put on them to take up work that is inappropriate. In fact, I spoke to two sole parents who were both doing the same course, who were both articulate, uh, articulate educated women, solo mothers of one child each, and both of them said that they felt for the other women undertaking the employment course because of the fact that if, if they were vaguely passive or passive in any way, then despite the fact that the work that was being pushed on them was inappropriate, they would often end up going, OK, I'll do it. Uh, this topic actually raised a really interesting conversation in Select Committee, and that conversation was around the availability of ECE outside of standard working hours. And a concern that was raised at the Select Committee is whether we as a country are moving down the track where we would think that night care for children is actually acceptable. Because I think the general public would agree that ECE, and I don't think it can actually be deemed that if it's just a babysitting service at night time, ECE is not appropriate at night time. And I think that would be, most New Zealanders would be fearful of that becoming commonplace in this country. So we did put amendments up. One to say that actually it shouldn't be moved to 20 hours, it should remain 15 hour work obligation. And the evidence that we found was actually in countries like the UK and the US where work obligations like this were imposed. Unfortunately, the reality for these sole parents was that often they ended up having to take, the lowest pay, uh, take up the lowest paid work and they ended up worse off than what they were when they were just accessing welfare full time. And that is the risk that I think we're running here. The other risk is that we've seen so many media reports, so many reports in general out about the quality and um, availability of ECE. And so the assumption is always, oh, you can put your child into an ECE centre and go out and work. But actually, sometimes 
there's no ECE available, sometimes there's no quality ECE available. And why should parents be put in the situation where they're forced to put their children into care when they are not confident that that level of care is appropriate for their children? Mr Chair? Mr Carmel Chair? Mr Chair, one of the SOPs that I put up actually also adds study as an option along part, aside part-time work. And I really want to talk a little bit about that because that government, the national government, have talked about being aspirational for New Zealanders on so many occasions. But I really feel that where it's clear that they're not is whenever it comes to beneficiaries. This SOP is aspirational. We don't want to just force sole parents out into any old job. We want them to be better equipped to increase their earning capacity, to increase their chances of being able to get into long-term secure work rather than just push them out into the whatever minimum wage job is available. We think that the national government should support this because it is aspirational. Now, we had some conversation about this in select committee as well, and what came up was, well, actually, they can access the student allowance. There are issues with that. The issue with that is that you have to be in full-time study to access a student allowance, or 32 hours a week. Now, any parent that might want to access, say, 20 hours, 20 or 15 hours of study, will not be supported to do so with all of these measures in place. They won't be able to access a student allowance, work obligations will kick in, and so, therefore, study will basically be denied from these parents. Why would we deny the opportunity for these parents to take up study? We know all of the educational research out there supports them doing this. We know the impact that can have on their children in terms of their children's own academic um, attainment. And so why would we not support this to happen? I really urge all parties in the House to look carefully at that SOP and to take seriously the option of study alongside part-time work. I, um, like I know, there have been a number of other MPs in this House as a sole parent actually studied um, and was able to access support. So why would we deny that of others, given that there are so many in this House that were accessing support from the state whilst raising children by themselves um, in order to take up study and better their own lives and the lives of their children, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I just want to go back to my other SOP, which which deletes clauses four, six, seven, and eight. Uh, and Mr. Mr. Chair, one of those is to do with raising the age of um, work obligations kicking in, or, or changing the age from work obligations kicking in from the current age of five to what's being proposed by the national government, and that's being three. We did have discussion at select committee. This came through in many of the submissions. Um, many parents do go back to work when the youngest turns three. That's okay. That's okay if that's a choice. But different parents have different circumstances that need to be taken into account. Uh, one of the topics of conversation in select committee was, hey, you know, that might be okay for the parent that has one or two children. But what do you do with the parent who has four or five children? Um, perhaps it's a little bit harder for that parent to go back to work when their youngest turns three. Uh, and I just want to point out that all too often, when we're talking about those parents who have four or five children, uh, we get this kind of attitude and stigma that comes with that, as if they did something wrong by giving birth to all these children. Well, actually, I just want to say, on this side of the house, there's no stigma or judgment attached to it. All we care about is the well-being of those children. And if it's in the best interest of those children for that parent to stay home with them for a little bit longer, then why wouldn't we support that? So many of the submissions made for this bill supported the additional $25 a week, despite the fact they felt it needed to be more. But so many of the submitters pointed out the fact that actually parenting needs to be valued as well. And the fact that we're stigmatising these parents to the point where we're assuming they don't want to go out and work, when actually the evidence suggests otherwise, many of them do, um, but that if they need to, then we should be responsible and actually support them to be the stay-home parent they need to be in instances where it will be better off for their family, Mr Speaker. Um, and Mr Chair, 
Mr Chair, I had a lot to do with the team from the Growing Up in New Zealand study uh, with respect to teasing out some of the research that they've done that's relevant to this bill. And I just want to clarify for the House that all of that research shows that actually these sole parents, predominantly sole mothers, do want to work. In fact, their research shows they've got more of a um, more of a desire to work than the parent that's in a relationship. So we should support them to I do what's best for them and their families.